Thank you, Ross. It's great to be here. I really appreciate the opportunity today. It's such an, such an honor to be with you and, and especially such an honor to speak today. I just can't help as I, as, as I sit this morning and worship and take the Lord's Supper and think about days gone by and, and past days. And I look around and over the past 20, maybe 30 years, uh, the congregation here at Moulton has, has changed. There's, uh, uh, there's, there's uh, uh, some members who aren't here now and used to be here and they've passed on to glory. And there's members that are here today that are relatively new. So everything changes as we go forward in our lives and especially having the opportunity to speak in Brad's place. And, and I just want to say up front, uh, Brad is an incredible speaker. His knowledge is absolutely phenomenal. Uh, the, the, his ability to take scriptures and to translate those scriptures into knowledge for us as a congregation to apply every single day is absolutely amazing. So I appreciate what Brad and his family and Brooke and what they do here at this congregation. But I just reflect back on uh, uh, the first time I had an opportunity to speak like this publicly. And uh, I don't think I'll ever forget it, uh, but it was... Uh, it was on Memorial Day weekend back in the early 90s, and Clinton Harden, uh, Brother Clinton was an elder at that particular time, and I remember him meeting, he ran into me, of course I always uh, tried to see uh, Clinton and Barbara, you know, wh when I was here, even in the younger days, I do now as older, but back in the younger days, it still was the same case, uh, that Clinton would seek, seek me out and engage in conversation, be a part of my life and my family's life and Sherry's life and our kids' life. And I remember where we were standing. We were standing just outside the conference room, and he asked me if I would speak this coming Sunday night, which would have been Memorial Day weekend. And, uh, of course, at that particular time in my life, uh, I'm 59 now, so subtract those years back in the early 90s. And and uh, uh, the hesitation initially, the natural hesitation, and then uh, saying, yes, I would. And I remember putting things together, and I remember being here that night. And, and of course, uh, Clinton knew that it was Memorial Day weekend, everybody would be traveling, and so there wasn't many people here that Sunday night. So anyway, he knew that was a good opportunity uh, for me to, to kind of uh, get my toes wet and to kind of break the ice and be able to speak. And now, by the grace of God, and, and the love that Christ has shown to me, my family, that I get to speak. I have the honor to speak all across the USA, uh, even internationally in, in Ghana and uh, Africa, West Africa, about the grace and the mercy of Jesus Christ. So I just want to set that as a context of, of why. Know our pur knowing our purpose. If you want to go ahead and turn to Ephesians chapter 2, that's the only place we're going to be today. So I hope you have your Bible. I think well, probably there's one that's in front of you that you can grab. I don't have any scripture in my PowerPoint that I know of anything significant. So I want you to get your Bibles out, and I want you to pull scripture. I want you to pull this chunk of scripture. I think maybe it was Brad that said early on when he was here at Moulton that, that we need to spend more time just reading, studying chunks of scripture. And that's what I want to do today. I'm a bit dyslexic, and it's tr I have trouble jumping from Scripture to Scripture. And so we all have to find what works best for us. And no matter what we do in our professions, our personal lives, our daily lives, our spiritual lives, we just always have to find what works for us. And this seems to be what works for me. So we're going to do an exposition of Ephesians chapter 2. And I want to draw this, uh, this thesis of, that I want you to just think about today. I want just for the morning, just for a few minutes this morning, I want you to think about knowing your purpose in the gospel. And as I often say, I'm oftentimes a one-trick pony because if you hear me speak any other time, you're probably going to hear the same message that is knowing our purpose what do we do to become relevant? How do we become relevant? And so what we are essentially doing is taking fundamental Christianity, those fundamentals that we know about the gospel, and we're translating those fundamentals into action. We're translating those fundamentals into faith and service. 
And so that's what I'm talking about today. Not just knowing the Scripture, not just understanding the Scripture, but taking that knowing and that understanding of Scripture and translating it into some sort of action. Essentially, what we're doing is we're translating it into a purpose for us. Not just a purpose for our personal lives, but then that purpose becomes echoing and resonating, and that purpose becomes translated into those that are around us. We become influential on those that are around us. Maybe it's our children, maybe it's our, the friends of our children, maybe, and I'm not just talking about children, I'm not just talking about young children. I'm also talking about older children because I have older children and I can guarantee you that they're still watching Sherry and me, what we do, how we deal with things, how we manage our lives, and that'll be reflected in their lives as they go forward. And so it becomes our responsibility to know our purpose, know our focus, know how we can become relevant, and then reflect that relevance, that image of Christ, that image of God to our children, our families, our coworkers, or wherever that might be, and to reflect it to them as they go forward. I like to talk about context. I think context is such an important part of studying scriptures. That is essentially knowing our context. Knowing our context. Know the context. That's not just important in scripture. That's important in every single thing that we do, isn't it? It's important. You have to know a little bit of history. You have to know a little bit of background. You have to know a little bit of context. And so when I described uh, Brother Clinton inviting me to speak years and years ago, that puts context to why I'm here today. That puts context in the significance that that meant to me. That adds context. And so scripture is really no different. It has to, all scripture is in context of history and then in context of other history. In other words, when Paul is writing to the Ephesian church, He's really talking about his experiences in his life that's being revealed through Christ, through the divine nature of gospel, the inspiration of Christ to him. Paul was no common person before his conversion. Paul studied at the feet of Gamaliel, uh, who was a Pharisee, not just a Pharisee, but one of the top Pharisees in the Jewish ancient world. And so Paul sat at his feet and he knew what Jewish law meant. He understood Jewish law. He understood the, not just Jewish law, but he understood Jewish customs and how it all related together. You see, we as Christians, we know Jewish, I mean, we know Christian scripture, but we also have to integrate that, that Christian scripture into Christian culture and then U.S. culture and, and how all that relates together. And, and, and we have to understand that. When I'm working in, in West Africa, I often forget that sometimes the people that we're working with don't understand the context of what I'm saying because they're not involved in the culture here. I can say, you and I, we communicate without even communicating sometimes because we know the culture. And that's the way Paul was back in these early days. He knew Jewish culture. He knew how Jewish people thought. And not only did he know how they thought, they thought, but he also understood that culture. And then it translates into the Roman world. He, he was part of the Roman government. And because he knew politics and he understood politics and based on his writing and the way he achieved his writing, it's obvious that he was very good at politics because Christianity doesn't exist in a bubble. It's, it, it, is, it, is, it is implemented through relationships and connections with other people. Right now, we have to do that in whatever we do. We have to build relationships, and we have to understand how that works together. So Paul knew the Roman government, and he understood how that integrated into Jewish culture. So knowing the context is very, very important. And as we know the context, then we, we can tend to know the why. Know the why. This is such an important concept of knowing the why. There's books out there. There's, 
I'm not a big book reader. Uh, now with the advent of the internet, I may, maybe it's uh, amplified my, my, um, my lack of focus, and so I just kind of jump from thing to thing. But there's books out there. If we can understand why, then we can set into motion our principles of purpose. So knowing the why is so important in understanding. We, uh, we, it was back last summer, we had gone into a village and we had drilled a well in a very, very remote location. One of the most remote locations that, that I have been to in West Africa in terms of where we were able to drill the well. Just put it in context, put it in background, is we flew all the way to West Africa, we landed in the capital city of Accra, we, we took a flight from Accra, which is an hour flight, would be a seven hour drive to a remote location in an area called Tomali. And then from Tomali, it's, it's a three hour drive on the blacktop from Tomali. And then once you get off the blacktop, we drove, Sherry was with us, and we drove for about an hour on just dirt roads. Dwayne knows, he knows what that's, he knows what that's like, and the others that have been there with us. But that is pretty remote. If you draw a line between, I know we often say, we often use the you know, Timbuktu as being this remote location. If you measure the distance between that location and Timbuktu and Mali, it's about a day and a half drive. It's about a 16 hour drive. So you're not very far from Timbuktu. We drove up to this village and we were able to get a well. And this older uh, village chief, I mean, I don't know how old he was, but he had to have been in his 80s. But tears rolled down his eyes when we drilled that well for them. And he made the statement that I live here, my father lived here, and my grandfather has lived here in this village, and no one has ever come to help us. Now, when you, when you understand that, when you see someone that, that enjoys and relishes in clean water, and then you hear that kind of story, then it puts context to the why it is so important to that particular individual, that man, to be able to to have clean water and, to, and to, to enjoy it. And then we all, we all the, the gospel since that time has been able to flourish in that community as a result of that. So once we know the why, we ask the question why, then it, it's able to amplify our purpose. Knowing the why, I'll often have someone to give me a situation uh, also working in some consulting, and they'll give them, they'll lay out this con situation, and, and I'll just, after they've talked for about five minutes, I'll say, okay, what are you trying to accomplish? And, they, and they'll, in one sentence, they'll say, I'm trying to accomplish this. And I say, okay, that's what we're going to do. So once you know the why, then you can proceed. The gospel is the same way. Paul is so influential in his teaching because he understands what his purpose is and why he's doing it. If we look at scripture, and I'm just going to pull it out now. I'm just going to, I'm just going to read uh, uh, Ephesians chapter 2, verses 1 through 10. As for you, you were dead in your transgressions and sin, in which you used to live when you followed the ways of the world and the ruler of the kingdom of the air and the spirit who is now at work in those who are disobedient. Verse 3. All of us also lived among them at one time, gratifying the cravings of the flesh and following its desires and thoughts. Like the rest, we were by nature deserving wrath. So next slide. If we look at... If we look at it's, it's the particular scripture here. We can see that in, in, in verse 2 and 3 that we were deserving of the wrath of God. We were deserving of the wrath that was to be put on us. All of God's demands and perfect righteousness were fulfilled by Christ. The moment we see by grace, that is the goodness, his death becomes our death. 
and his condemnation as our condemnation, and his righteousness as our righteousness. And, by, and at that particular point in this scripture, God becomes 100% for us in that instant. That is a beautiful concept to know. I don't know if I've ever really heard that, but it's true based on Scripture, not because it's what I think, but if you put Scripture all together and, and you understand from the very beginning that from the very beginning of time, we were the elect of God. And because we're the elect of God, then God is 100% on our side. Now, there's times when we struggle in life and we feel like God doesn't love us or maybe God's not behind us or maybe God has forgotten about us. But that's all just in our minds because based on Scripture, especially this particular Scripture, God is 100% behind us and He's always pulling for us. That's a great thing. Oftentimes there will be a discussion and, and there will be, uh, be conflict among a group that's discussing maybe at a table and, and all you have to say is, look, I'm on your side. Just because I'm making comments doesn't mean I'm, on your, I'm not on your side. I'm on your side, and I'm pulling for you. So God is, becomes 100% for us in this scripture. As we, as we look on and we go forward, we can see that the freeness of grace exists. Now, what Paul essentially is doing, and, and he... Next slide. What Paul essentially is doing is he is, a, is, is building the case because he's well studied. He's building this thesis. He's saying, because I was dead and because uh, I, I had no hope and, and I, was, res, I had resigned to my sin and the fleshly cravings of my sins, that now going forward that things have changed for me. And because things have changed for me, it's, presu it's producing a result. And so if you look at, at the scripture between verses 4 and 9, Ephesians chapter 2, verses 4 and 9, Paul continues to lay out this thesis. He continues to, uh, to, 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 to bring it to life as he talks about it. And verse 4 is where I left off. So go back to verse 4. Now, no matter what translation you're looking at, most likely the next word, the first word in verse 4 is but. And so what Paul is doing, he's creating this transition between the way we used to be and, and what things used to be like before the goodness and the grace of God, before Christ died on the cross, this is the way things used to be. And you get to verse 4 and it says, because of the great love for us. We could just stop right there and we could just go home. Because that is so powerful. We were deserving of the wrath of God. But because of his great love for us, not for our goodness, but because of his love for us. God, who is rich in his mercy, verse 5, made us alive with Christ even when we were dead in our transgressions. It is by grace you have been saved. Now, there's a dash there in, in most translations there's a dash there. It's like all, it's, and what that dash means is the, the, the sentence ends, if you use a dash in your writing or you use maybe a colon, I'm, you know, English teachers, please forgive me, but if you use a, like a semicolon or a dash or maybe a colon, sometimes I just do dot, 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 then I continue my, my thought. But the sentence is basically ended and I'm just going to add this on to the end. And that's what... Paul is doing here in this writing. He's essentially finished his sentence, but he says it's by grace that you've been saved. That'll come back up just a few sentences later. And as Brad often says, if you have something, the what, what the, in ancient writing, it's to be able to emphasize something, you often repeat it. And so Paul is not waiting to the end of this chapter to repeat it, but Paul is going to repeat it in just a few, just a few uh, verses down. And verse 6, and says, And God raised us up from Christ and seated us with him in heavenly realms in Jesus Christ. Not only does God love us, not only is it his love 
but he's essentially raised us up to be with him. Now, you've got to put this in context. Back in these days, it would be very, very uncommon. Even today, it's uncommon, but it's more uncommon maybe in democracy and, and, and the U.S. and this experiment we have in democracy. But you're able to associate. I know some of you maybe have really good con uh, connections and and relationships with uh, politicians, maybe senators in D.C. or congressmen, or maybe maybe folks higher up in that, and you're able to sit and you be in the presence, be in the presence of them. But in this day, the the audience that Paul is trying to reach are the people that have had zero opportunity to do anything related to being part of any kind of any kind of kingdom. They have had no hope. It's, it, we're born into it. It's like in England. You're born into it, and there's no way of you achieving that. And so what Paul is saying in the scripture, not only does Christ love us, but he seated us with him at the table. What an honor it would be if we were able to sit at the table with royalty. Or maybe your favorite politician or whoever that might be. What an honor that would be to sit at that table. And that's what Paul is trying to communicate to the church at Ephesus here and anybody else that will listen, that you have access now to the throne. Wow, that's big. When you have access to a throne, we don't really say it like that now, but I know if you, if you back in the ancient times, having access to a throne was a really big deal. In verse 7, in order that in the coming ages he might show his incomparable riches of his grace. Still extending his grace. If I, don't, if I forget to say it, I'm going to say it now. If you look at all of Paul's writings, I'm pretty sure it's every single book that he wrote. He begins it with grace and mercy. He begins it with the love of Christ. And he bookends it at the end with grace and mercy and the love of Christ. So it's expressed in the kindness, kindness to us in Jesus Christ. For In verse 9, For it is by grace you have been saved through faith, and it is not, your, your set, not from yourself, it is a gift of God. So it's not, I, we're saved by grace, and it's not something that's not our righteousness, it's not our goodness, but it's our faith in carrying out the message of the gospel or putting the gospel into our lives and following the gospel message. I often say, uh, we, we say obeying the gospel. That's an old term I can remember back in the old days. I don't know if you hear that anymore, but maybe you do. But it's oh, how our faith is based in our us obeying the gospel. And that's the, the belief, the death, the, the burial bear uh, of the Christ in baptism, our confession of faith, not just confession uh, uh, when we decide to, to become a child of God, but it's our daily confession. It's not just something we do one time. It's not just we confess that Christ is our Lord and our Savior up here before we're baptized, but it's our confession every single day we go about our lives and we live. That is confessing that Christ is our Lord and our Savior based on our service, based on our love for Christ, based on our obedience. And then that, that is reflected around all those that, that are in our midst or are part of our circle. We all have these circles that we exist in. It's not by works, verse 9, not by works, so that one may boast. Now, put this in context. Why would Paul, he talks about this throughout his writings often. In Corinthians, he talks about only boast in the gospel, only boast in Lord Jesus Christ, only boast in his death, his burial, and his resurrection. Those are the most important things. Why would he say that? We see in the Pharisee world, just study Matthew. Study the book of Matthew. It's my favorite gospel to study. But study the book of Matthew, and it seems like Christ's mission in the book of Matthew is to discount and discredit the hypocrisy of the Pharisees and the Sadducees. So many times in the book of Matthew does Paul say, does Paul, does Paul mention the fact of the hypocrisy of the Pharisees. And the Pharisees and the Sadducees were so caught up in the works. 
they were so caught up in the tradition. They were so caught up in what they did from day to day to make them look religious, to make them seem like they were pious, to make them seem like they were not just religious, but they're more religious than anybody else out there. You see, what was it about? They prayed in public places, not just not to pray, but to be seen praying. They gave dill and cumin and spices not simply for the fact of giving them away or to sacrifice those, but they sacrificed those oftentimes to be seen by other people who saw their great sacrifice and then they would have this political clout, this political authority, and then they would essentially have control over the people around them. Now, I'm really being harsh on the Sadducees and Pharisees. And if I lived in that culture where that's all I knew and I was only raised in that Jewish custom, I probably would be much more sympathetic to it as I see today. We oftentimes were working in Islamic cultures in our mission program and we have to be sympathetic to that's all they know, it's all they've ever known. And we have to factor that into our teaching as we teach the gospel and we lead them toward the goodness and the grace and the mercy of the gospel. Oftentimes, if someone gives their life to Christ in Islamic communities in northern Ghana, they are completely shunned by their families. They can never go home again. So you can imagine being an older teenage girl and giving your life to Christ. Where are you going to go? What are you going to do? So you have to be sympathetic to those as you, as you teach them the gospel and teach the goodness of Christ. And so in context of this scripture that Paul is saying, not by works, not by those things that we do that people see us doing, but it's because of the righteousness and the goodness of God so that no one can boast. Oftentimes the Pharisees and the Sadducees, they spent most of their time boasting on how pious and how religious they are. Do you know anyone like that? I think we probably all know some people like that. And then the last verse, which probably has the most significance in this scripture. Because as you can see, the way it's been written and the way I'm reading it, it's all leading up to this crescendo. It's all leading up to this major point. And that is, for we are God's handiwork, created in Christ Jesus to do good works, which God prepared in advance for us to do. You see, that's our purpose. That's our mission. That's how we are relevant. Not just simply knowing scripture and being able to know scripture and, and yes, knowing scripture is very important, but that's not a means to an end. It's knowing scripture well enough so that we can take it forward and we can do good works because of what Christ has done for us. Not only can we do it now, but because we look in the world, there's so much challenge, there's so much poverty, there's so much strife, there's so much conflict. And so if you live by faith, it really creates this big field for us to work in, right? It creates this huge platform for us to take this message of what Paul is teaching to us as Christians and taking that out into the world and using that conflict and that struggle and that poverty to shine light, being reflected through us to the power of who God is. So, as we continue on, the freeness of grace... The freeness of grace is so important to us. The Apostle Paul, I'm sorry, I'm, I've gotten ahead of you. Uh, one more slide. One more slide. Created to do good works. Our purpose in the grace of God is putting faith into action of service. Faith cannot boast in human goodness or a competence of wisdom because faith focuses on the free, all supplying the grace of God. Whatever goodness faith sees, it sees the fruit of grace. Next slide. Knowing your why. 
This is basically the subtitle of my message today, Knowing Your Why. So some practical takeaways as we have read the scripture and we've talked about the, the spiritual context. Okay, how do we put it into our lives tomorrow? Tomorrow, Monday morning, your alarm's going to go off. You're going to jump up. You're going to do what you do on Monday morning, and you're going to go into the world. It's really easy on Sundays to, to have this mindset. But as we start our Monday mornings, what, do, what are the key takeaways? What are the practical takeaways? No, first of all, is knowing why you're doing it. Paul understood why he was doing it. He understood it because of the grace, his transformation. How he was transformed by the goodness and the grace of God. And you've got to look at Paul's background. What did Paul do? He was persecuting the church. He knew that he deserved the wrath of God. But he was in awe of the grace and the mercy that had been given to him because of the goodness of who God was. There are benefits, number one, there are benefits to it developing a sense of purpose. That probably goes without saying. People who feel a sense of purpose in their lives may be better able to handle daily stress and regulate their emotions. This was actually not my, this was a study that was done at Cornell University not too long ago, but this is what the study found, is that if you have a life filled with purpose, now this is obviously a secular study, but it has spiritual implications because if you focus your life on spiritual things like Ephesians chapter 2, then you can achieve this. You can achieve this. A sense of purpose. Number three, Paul, the Apostle Paul knew his purpose and he reflected it, he reflected it in his life. We can see through his writings and it's, he's often been said he's one of the most influential writers in the New, New Testament. Think about the influence that Paul has had on not just Christianity, but, then, but the way societies are established. He was a student of Socrates. He was philosophy. I know I went, uh, Dad and I were in the museum, uh, we're in the Library of Congress not too long ago, and you go into the Library of Congress and you, and you can stand on the, the balcony and you can look, and there's statues in all corners of the of the Library of Congress in DC. And uh, you've, got a, you've, got a, you've got all these statues of, of these philosophers, uh, Socrates, et cetera, uh, and then you've got the Apostle Paul is there as well. Because he's part of the influence of where we are today. So influential in, in the way we think and how we think as a society and as Americans, and then how that translate in, translates into the gospel, and, and then how we impact those around us here locally, and then how we impact those globally. Paul's purpose was shaped by his past. Speaking of his, the eternal death that's in the scripture, and the future, which is by grace. Every person in here today is shaped by their past, whether you admit it or not. We're all shaped by our experiences, how we were raised, who we were raised by, our circumstances surrounding how we were raised. We all are shaped by that. And so how we, we take that and we put it into, into purpose and, and put it into action is how we focus on the why. Why are we doing it? What's the purpose of why we're doing it? And what are our experiences in our lives that can help us do it better? That's the beauty of the gospel. It's like a diamond. No matter how much you flip it over and you turn it from side to side, it's equally as beautiful like a diamond because everyone in here has a circumstance, a relationship, an experience in their past when they can help someone as they encounter them in their daily lives in their circle. In conclusion, knowing our purpose, that is knowing the why, in the gospel, it leads to faith in action. When we know God is and always was, very important to know, 100% behind us on his, righteous, on his righteousness and not on our own, we are motivated by grace like Paul to serve in the future. I encourage us all to focus on this particular passage as the days go forward. 
to focus on how it relates to our lives, how we can better serve our humanity around us, how can we can spiritually be better, how we can study more and find ways to incorporate scripture into our lives and then pass that forward into the, our circles around us and how we can influence everyone around us. There may be someone here today that has not given their life to Christ in baptism. Today's a great day to do that. Today's a great opportunity to, like the Apostle Paul, to be influenced and to be, uh, to be impacted, to be affected, to be transformed or changed by the goodness and the grace and the mercy of God. Today's a great day for that, to be buried with Christ in baptism. I'm sure there's plenty of, of folks in the eldership and the leadership here at this church that will assist you in that. And also, maybe uh, if you're like me, you're just oftentimes struggling with the daily lives that we live and the pace that we live and the struggles that we have as we go through daily lives. And the church here at Moulton will be happy to pray for you based on any circumstance that you might have as we stand and as we sing.